Okay, good afternoon everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedule today uh, to join us for the first session on webinars on research skills for library liaisons. I'm just going to turn off my video for now. Hope everyone can see it anyway. Video. Okay, um, my name is Lynette and I'm from Griffith University. I shall be the moderator for today. I also have Justine Cowley, uh, a resident QLOC executive officer, and Sue Hickson from Griffith University and the convener of the Library and Information Services Working Party to help facilitate today's session. Before we get started, I'd just like to go through some webinar rules. Um, just be aware that this session is being recorded, <coughs> our audio and the chat. Um, also, we've just turned off the video for now because it does slow the things down. But as each presenter is going through, we'll just flash their face first and then we'll just turn it off. Also, I have muted everyone's microphone at the moment. Um, when it comes to Q&A, please raise your hand and then we'll unmute you so you can ask the question. If you're unable to speak, we'll definitely use the chat box and I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, just going to the next slide here. Also, just making sure that everyone is okay and everyone can hear me. Can you just give me a tick um, to say that you're okay? There should be a little tick hand underneath your name. Great, I can see lots of ticks coming through. If you can't hear anything or you're not responding, just click no. <laughs> There's lots of things happening for you. No, we've got 15 ticks. Great, 16. Excellent. Everyone knows where the tick is? Great, I'll just clear that. Okay, um, also, um, I'd like to say a big thank you to Jackie Walsenholm. She's the convener of Research Support Working Party and she organised this series of webinars today. So over to you, Jackie, if you'd like to say a few words. So, hi everybody. I'm, um, my name's Jackie Walstenholm. I'm the Research Services Librarian at JCU. And I'd like to say welcome to everyone for this first webinar in the series. <coughs> We've had a fantastic response in terms of the number of inquiries and the number of registrations. So I'm really looking forward to this series. I hope that you find the webinars really beneficial. And <coughs> research support is an important growth area for our librarians who have had have a liaison role. And so these webinars are designed to give you tips, skills and knowledge for working in these roles. We've allowed ample time for discussion in each webinar. So for this and all the other webinars, please use the chat box to ask your questions or make comments. And now I'll hand over to Sue to introduce the speaker for the first webinar. Sorry, thanks Jackie. Oh, there's my video. I've quickly flashed on. Hi everyone, I'm Sue Hickson from um, Griffith University. Um, I'm here to introduce Louise Howard, the Director of Library and Learning Services from Griffith University. Um, and I'll just read her bio, but I'm going to quickly switch my video off now. Um, Louise Howard has almost 20 years experience in the information services field. She's previously worked within Brisbane City Council Library Services and Queensland State Archives. More recently, she was the manager information services at the Department of Transport and Main Roads, overseeing a statewide library service and information governance program for the regionally distributed government agency. Prior to joining Griffith in 2015, she held the role of Director, Business Management within Information Technology at TMR where she drove the successful implementation of a cloud-based library management system and as program executive the implementation of IP telephony systems for the department delivering significant cost savings and efficiencies. She's been an active member of the Queensland Government Senior Office's Open Data Working Group and contributed to the development of TMR's Open Data Strategy. Louise holds a BA from the University of Tasmania, 
a Master's in Applied Science Information Management from Charles Sturt University and a Grad Cert in Business Administration from QUT. She also holds Prince2 Project Management Foundation Certification. So I'd like to welcome Louise um, and our very first uh, webinar presenter. Just bear with us for two seconds. Sorry, we just have a bit of technical problem, but we've got um, Louise now as Sue, because for some reason the other computer's not working. Hello, hopefully everyone can hear me now. Yes, great. So I know it says Sue Hickson under my name, but I'm not Sue, I'm Louise, so nice to meet you all. And I think Lynette's going to take my video off so I'm not distracted by looking at myself during the presentation and during the webinar. Okay. So hello, thank you all for joining us for uh, the first webinar. I feel quite privileged to be the first presenter throughout this series and I think it's going to be an excellent set of webinars and resources for our staff in libraries and through QLOC to actually hear what's going on in our industry. So today I've been asked to speak a little bit about some of the global trends that we need to consider or that are impacting on academic libraries, uh, particularly in the research space or for our liaison librarians. So I'm going to step through some of those trends and then also talk through uh, some of the keys that I see from my perspective and that I've observed as being essential to helping us deal with some of those trends and some of those challenges. Now I just have to work out how to move through to the next slide. There we go. Okay. So some context initially. We're at the point now, not just within the library industry, but within the academic and tertiary environment where we don't just have an evolution of change, we've got a, a paradigm shifting transformation occurring. We've got a global knowledge economy. Uh, it's been estimated that open data is worth around $68 billion to the Australian economy. We've got a changing client base and a changing population within our tertiary environment as well. And all of these things are impacting on university libraries and university librarians. So what I'm going to do is step through some of the key trends, which should hopefully, nope, nope, what did I do? Oh, here we go, we're back. <laughs> this is our first one, we'll get it right. Look, Lynette's being wonderful and helping me through all my technical glitches. So you'll see there are a number of trends that I've listed and I'm not going to talk too quickly to this slide because we'll step through them as we go through the actual webinar itself. So trend one, and this is something that we've been observing in libraries for a number of years, and that's the delivery of user-centred library services. So rather than our services being driven by how we want to develop our collection or by our normal standards of metadata and structure, they're now being driven by what our users want. There's an expectation within our current client base that we're going to deliver services in their space. They've become accustomed to being able to access things when they want them, where they are and in the format they want. Uh, it's no longer through the carefully constructed pathways of our online computers of our online catalogues. They're actually looking for them within the spaces and within the systems they're working in. Um, the New Media Consortia 2015 Horizon Report identified personalised learning as a major shift in the way our clients are consuming our services. So they're looking for a tailored and a centred approach around the way they want to operate. Um, some of the data driven, driven projects that we've got at universities are beginning to assist us to get some metrics so that we can use that type of data to understand what our clients, what our students want. Uh, but this type of expectation that we're going to actually tailor our services to their needs 
is going to impact on all sorts of services within our space. So it's what's known as a disruptive change. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, a disruption is more than just an improvement. So we change things all the time. We improve them, we, we make them better. Disruption is about not improvement, it's about doing something completely different and in a new way. Uh, for example, MOOCs uh, had a meteoric rise there for a while and they've now taken a little bit of a dive with people becoming a little bit sceptical. But they're going to, they have been and they will continue to be a, a disruptive technology for most universities, particularly universities who are maybe not as efficient as others. There's increasing competition now within the tertiary sector. So it's not only a traditional university that's out there providing avenues for education for our broad client base. Our pedagogical models are changing. So we've got online and flipped classrooms. Uh, and we have to work out what impact this particular change is going to make on our service models in libraries. And we've got new models of scholarly communication. So scholars are linking directly to other scholars and students. We've got technology that's enabling that type of engagement now rather than coming to us as the expert. So the overarching framework for all changes is a focus on what users do. So we need to be looking at research, teaching and learning rather than what librarians do, which is collections, reference and instruction. It doesn't mean that those things aren't valued, but we can't present our services with those as our terms of reference. We need to be looking at what our users are doing and presenting it within their frame of reference. We need to move our role from the role of experts with the expectation that we can shape it according to how we operate and work on how we can partner and merge with our, our clients, our faculty, our students, our researchers and develop a collaborative arrangement across organisations. This is technology, this is one of the ones I find really exciting actually. I think enabling technologies are going to allow us to do so many things. At the same time, they're a little bit scary. I don't know how many of you right now are wearing a Fitbit or a smartwatch. Uh, possibly you've got an app on your phone that records your steps. Uh, possibly you have other devices. Uh, according to Gartner, who is an ICT research company many of you may be familiar with, the average tertiary, tertiary student will be carrying or wearing about eight devices that connect to the web at any one time. So that's eight. Not, not just a phone in their pocket, but up to eight things that they're collecting data with, they're connecting with and they're engaging with. So this is here and it's happening now. This is the expectation that they have of how they're going to be able to engage with their environment. So looking at some of these other enabling technologies, we have things like gamification. So how do we take our studies and use the approach to gamification to actually enable our students to learn in a different way? Uh, maker spaces is one that I'll, I'll touch on a little bit later when we look at the, the impact on our spaces, but there are other internet enabling technologies as well, so it's the magic web, the internet of things is amazing. So we're going to move from having around, I think it's 63 billion sensors that are connecting to the web or devices that are connecting to the web to around about 250 billion devices that are going to connect with sensors or sensors that are going to connect to the web. So if you think about it, think about your fridge talking to the internet, think about your car talking to the internet now with its sat nav, think about your uh, microwave, think about your TV downloading the latest software update. These are all, this is the internet of things, this is where the new collection of data is going to occur and these are major industry societal trends that are going to impact on universities and Subsequently, they're impacting on our industry as well. So we have to invest in preparing ourselves before we engage with our academic students and researchers. And we have to be prepared to seek opportunities to leverage that disruptive change. So we don't want to just look for ways to cope with it. We don't want to figure out how we're going to react and, and how we might be able to manage it. We actually need to step forward and grab it with both hands and work out how we're going to use this as an opportunity to really continue to add value as we have done for so long in our industry. Trend three is open. 
so open scholarship, open access, open publications, open data. Um, open scholarship is the principle that in an educational setting, the aim is to access a range of resources and information. So the library role in this has traditionally been through purchased access to print and electronic resources. Now the options and expectations for access are wider and broader and more varied. So our role has to evolve and change as well. We now have a role in looking at fully peer reviewed paywall journals. We look at items held in our institutional repositories. We look at institutionally created learning objects. How do we curate and manage and provide access to all of these? Uh, and part of our role in communicating open and the advantage of open is helping people understand that open access doesn't mean free. So open access isn't about having no, no dollars attached, but it's about being able to have a broad remit and to fully promote and fully open scholarship contents and resources to our academics and students by working together across organisations. So trend four is spaces. So we can't fully support digital scholarship uh, and the new way in which our, our academics and our researchers and our students want to learn and want to teach in spaces that were designed and based on access to physical print collections. It just doesn't work. It's not the right fit. Um, academic libraries have recognised that for a while now and we have started to change. Um, there's a number across the globe that are being reimagined to take advantage of things like the emerging makerspace movement. Um, so we've always been spaces that provide tools for learning, but now in addition to books we have things like 3D printers. Um, the physical layout of our libraries is being redrawn so that we're removing the large rows and stacks of books to either an archived space or being removed altogether and provided with electronic space and making room for a different and more productive use of that particular area. Uh, for instance, the, the Delamere Science and Engineering Library at the University of Nevada, Reno, was named as one of the most interesting maker spaces in America in 2014. Uh, they've changed the entire ground floor of their facility to be a functional space for self-directed learning with visualisation hardware and software. Uh, there's a great link to a video of the space online. I'll might have a chat to learn afterwards and we'll see if we can find a way to distribute that so that you can have a look at it yourself. Um, a great analogy that I've heard is that libraries used to be the grocery store. We used to go there, get what we wanted and take it home. From there, we've moved a little bit to becoming the kitchen. So they may come here and they may put something together with what we have here. But where we want to take our users, our spaces, is to libraries being not just the kitchen but also the restaurant. We want them to come here to access what we have, to create things with it, to consume it and to present it back to others. So we can be that space to our scholars and to our researchers and to our academics. Uh, but it does take change and it does take investment. Well, I think, and I should check and make sure I'm quoting this from somewhere, but I think it's a great quote. We can't just find new ways of doing the same old things. So I believe it was uh, Albert Einstein who said, you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. So we have to be able to think differently and have some transformative and disruptive ideas in order to be successful in this new space with these new trends. Trend five, um, the rise of information management. So this is looking at uh, the impact that we have of data, data creation, and data management. So there's an opportunity for libraries to reconceptualise data management and how data is discovered. Uh, there are some libraries and information focused organisations such as the European Library, the Library of Congress, Mendeley and CORE who are convening workshops to investigate and create new tools for data mining scientific publications and those tools identify patterns that are revealed in large sets of data which then lead back to providing breakthroughs in the accuracy and efficiency of research. Um, as universities and other learning focused institutions generate more data over time academic and research libraries are perfectly positioned to assist in managing and curating this information. Um, 
by digitally archiving data sets from publications, tagging them with metadata and keywords, making them searchable, library databases can uncover links and patterns between studies. Uh, this kind of innovation is causing people like the librarian at the University of Oxford Library to consider librarians becoming co-contributors to the creation of new knowledge. So we can work to present data in a way that enhances existing data sets through different visualisations. A big question to ask in this space is, do we as library professionals have the current skills that we need to really work in this space? Um, I'm going to leave that one hanging with you to think about for a little while. Trend six, atomised information for consumption of knowledge. So we live in a society where information is bite-sized. We download just the Twitter feed that we want. We have a look at just the Facebook group that we want. We look at social media. We hop online to the ABC News app and we access the piece of information we want. We don't buy the whole newspaper anymore. Um, we access what we want. We reuse, reuse it. We reshape it. Our clients are creating their own curated personal information stream using tools provided by technology. And they're coming to us with an expectation that the information they need for their research and their study is going to be available in the same sort of easily digestible format. So how do we facilitate that? We need to have more skills in licensing, more skills in negotiation, uh, more skills in looking at technical systems so that we can assist our students, our researchers, our academics in curating that information stream for themselves so that they can actually have that atomised information. Trend seven, smart content. So libraries no longer own things which sit on shelves. And I, and I say that generically. Obviously, we do. There's still many of us who have print collections. And those print collections aren't necessarily fading in the immediate future. But a large part of our investment is now into virtual. It's not into those physical things that sit on shelves. Uh, I believe 60% of our library resources are, are currently under commercial rather than statutory licenses. So we're subscribing to resources on an annual basis rather than purchasing things and owning them. Um, students are expecting more than just a printed textbook. They're looking for data. They're looking for multimedia. They're looking for hybrid. Uh, Publishers are trying to find new business models to deal with this uh, within what we all have, I'm sure, is a, a tight fiscal situation. So how do we transform our collection and transform our content? Uh, and how do we justify our argument for the budget to do that in order to support the aims of our organisations and the aims of our researchers, our academics? Uh, part of it is around the library is publisher. So there was a trend during the 1980s and the 90s where they closed, many of the university presses closed down and they started up again. And I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be 2000. I'm pretty sure that was an error in this. The last time I did it, two that I still haven't corrected. This is what happens when you go from Prezi to PowerPoint. The two don't work very well together. <laughs> um, but the internet now allows, I think we've got there, allows minnows. So it lets very small publishing and publishers and publishing options survive. So among the emerging models, for instance, is the mini monograph or the mini ebook, so which offers researchers a method of publishing works between the length of a journal article and a typical monograph, and was developed by Palgrave Macmillan in 2013. And it's the Palgrave Pivot, I believe it's called, is a new digital first research format that publishes within 12 weeks of acceptance post peer review. So again, we're hitting the time point. This new format was first envisioned as a response to academics seeking to publish work that doesn't fit within the guidelines imposed by traditional public format publishing formats. So we see again atomizing publishing. So we have iceberg snippets. People go out and sample small amounts and they dive into the larger depths of the icebergs when they want to be able to access that rather than needing to purchase everything all at once. Um, this isn't going to replace traditional academic outputs, but it is something that we need to consider as a complement and a way in which to support and enable 
academic outputs to be accessed and produced in a varying amount of ways. Trend nine, online, mobile and ubiquitous. So this is that personalised anytime, anywhere, technology enabled reading and our digital natives. Uh, I think something that within libraries we're certainly aware of and I'm not sure it's something our, our academics and our researchers are necessarily as cognizant of is that a digital native doesn't necessarily mean they're digitally literate. Uh, we have just because our students have been exposed to ubiquitous technology, it's not always reflected in their ability to leverage that technology or to apply critical thinking to the information they access when using it. There's some real value that we have as information professionals and learning and teaching professionals to support those digital natives to develop those critical thinking skills and those digital literacies that they need to be successful. So there's some great stats on this page. Uh, I think one of my favourites is the fact that 19% use their mobile device in the bathroom um, and that 67% use it while lying in bed. So this, we use it from the moment we wake up. Our mobile devices are our alarm clocks, they're our personal shopping device, they're our source of note taking, they're our clock. Uh, it's a multiple use for accessing, using and repurposing information. And looking there, we've got the September 2014 statistics, which says that in September 2014, there were 3.63 billion active, unique mobile users, which is about half the population of the planet. Uh, so anyone who thinks that just because you haven't got a smartphone yet that you can avoid it, I'm afraid it's probably unavoidable. <laughs> So, how do we deal with it? All these trends are coming down the, the line, they're going to impact on us. We've, we've looked at some of the things that exist and some of the ways they're going to be influencing the environment in which we work. A key one is organisational flexibility. We need to accept that change is the new normal. So, we're not going to reach a point where change is going to stop or where we've changed enough. Uh, we need to continue to change with our client base and with our competitors. So we now have competition for some of our core services. A uh, number of people think that discovery, the only discovery tool you really need is Google. Um, is it? Should it be? Should we be working towards that as well? What sort of flexibility do we need to put in place to support this? So, part of it is about looking at the new roles in research services. So we need to focus on interdisciplinary research and we need to focus on understanding our clients. So creating those program and centre and researcher profiles, understanding what it is that our clients actually need before we go in to deliver targeted workshops and consultations. It's about working with our academic partners to embed some of that literacy content, some of that atomised information, the bite-sized pieces at a point in time at which our students can digest it and consume it and where it can contribute to their success. For new types of librarian positions, we're going to see more emerge than what we've already seen. That's my prediction. So we already have data management librarians. We've got some focus there on copyright. But where does this go? Where does the partnership exist between a librarian and a research centre? Are we going to undertake their metadata management for them? Are we going to train them in how they're going to manage their own metadata? There's a number of different roles there. Uh, negotiation and licensing and contract management are key parts to any sort of information service. So with cloud-based services with cloud-based systems with so many different technologies out there, we need to be able to negotiate on behalf of our clients for the tools that they need to be able to do their jobs. The turn of um, the last century has signalled a real shift in what type of skill sets have real and applicable value in the world. So things like creativity and design and engineering are at the front tools such as 3D printers, robotics and 3D modelling and web-based applications. 
do we have that ICT skill-based knowledge to work with these people as librarians? Do we need it? Um, what we do have is our expertise in the areas of academic digital and information literacy. And this is in fact more important than ever. It's just about working with our partners to ensure that we can still combine that and deliver it and embed it within the current framework. The key two, which I think I've already alluded to a little bit, is collaboration. So the library's always been more than a collection or a place. It's a mechanism to deliver a consistent and valued service. Uh, and in order to be successful, we need to ensure we're working together with our, within our industry, within our organisations, and with our academics and our researchers and our students in order to be sure that we can actually survive and continue to add value in the new environment. We need to be advocates and consultants. So some of this is around communication. It's around ensuring that we actually understand what real engagement and real partnership means with our clients. Uh, we need to go out and seek and engage with people, not just wait for them to come to the library to ask us for assistance. And key three, which is absolutely essential, is we need to demonstrate our value and we have to be able to both understand and be able to explain our value in terms of our academics and researchers and students and our university organisations, senior management understand. So it needs to be in business terms. What value are we adding to the goals of the university when we assist our clients? So how do we show our contribution to things like increased student success and retention, increased researcher grants, increased impact of tertiary research? Um, we do it by aligning the focus of our services with business drivers and also by ensuring we capture data on what we do so that we can present that data back to our key stakeholders to help them understand where we're adding value. So this is more than just justifying our existence. This is about informing both our stakeholders and ourselves as to how we need to adapt and change in order to continue to demonstrate and deliver value. If we can't deliver value and we can't demonstrate value, we have to ask the question, are we needed? Um, and we must be able to do that. So what do we need to do? Here's the smiley face. That's a bit where you get to go, wow, now I can take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> we need to be intentional. So that's about being self-reflective, understanding what you're doing and understanding the aim of why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, be open to new ideas. They will come at you from all sorts of environments. We're working in some amazing organisations with researchers and academics with all sorts of amazing new ideas around us with students of all sorts of multiple generations who also have some great ideas. Be proactive and engage with stakeholders. Go out to your stakeholders. Talk to them. Find out what it is that they're working on, what their pain points are. Um, and be prepared for the paradigm shift. So our industry isn't going to remain as it once was, but I think there's some fantastic opportunity for it to still be an industry that's of huge value and contributes greatly to the success of our organisations and of our clients. And I think that's me. I think I'm done. We've survived the first webinar. <laughs> Technical <laughs> hitches aside. Uh, thank you, Louise. Now I'm Louise on the um, screen, so that'll confuse everyone. <clears throat> um, thanks very much. Can everyone please um, give uh, Louise a pause so we can work out how to do that? Um, under the smiley face and then applause. Oh look, you're all doing it already, wonderful. So thank you very much. Now we'll open up to questions. Um, so you can either uh, chat and so ask your question or you can, uh, and then we'll direct you to unmute so that you can actually ask or if you would prefer we can just um, ask Louise a question on your behalf. So um, we've got a raised hand here from and I don't get a full name that comes up, isn't it, Heidi? Can I see that? Yep. Um, we have. Oh, did Heidi? Did you have a question? I saw your hand was raised. You put it down. That may be just a thank you. Awesome, thank you. It's okay. Um, Graham, you also. Have, <laughs> sorry. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think Graham tweeted the PDF of the stats that I was quoting. Thank you, Graham. That's great. Yes, so Graham was asking about the anywhere in the time and in the past where uh, those stats came. And he's 
and he's tweeted it, so that's great. So do we have any questions? If you have a question, please raise your hand and we shall unmute your uh, unmute you so you can um, speak. So I'm just scrolling down this long, long list of participants. Um, I had a question, Louise, though I think you have um, answered it. Um, it's about um, being proactive and engaging with stakeholders and um, you know, what strategies or do you have any strategies for librarians new to liaison or to the research area about how they would go, um, you know, how they would start that engagement project? I think there's a couple of strategies there. there. One of the first is understanding the science. So there will be reports on the university website. There will be information around profiles about your research, profiles about your academics you're engaging with. And then the next step is go and meet them and talk to them. Make time to make them time and have a copy with them. If they don't have time, step into their, their classrooms where you can. If you can talk to the people that they interact with or the partners or the academics that they partner with to find out what it is that they need to contribute to their success. Really the key is engage, engage, engage and don't wait for them to come to you. So the whole key about being a librarian or engagement or getting out there is actually being proactive and, and stepping out of our comfort zone sometimes uh, and into the zone where our clients really need us to be to get full benefit of our services. Hi, it's Jackie here. Uh, I hi, Jackie. Yeah, I, I can basically get you in the background, Lynette. So, Louise, I have a question for you. That something that I'm interested in um, over the last year or so is, <coughs> could you comment on uh, how you see the role of liaison librarians that support a particular discipline and um, it, whether you think that there's a, uh, a role for them to be uh, uh, an expert in the discipline rather than teaching or, or research and so that they can know the resources for the particular discipline and then provide advice to academics or to students uh, about that discipline, discipline rather than the career stage? Sure, it's a great question Jackie uh, and it was something that I believe an academic from the Chinese Academy of Science at the recent CEDA conference highlighted that when they're looking for librarians to interact with some of their science disciplines specifically, he found it easier to find a science graduate and train them to be a librarian than he did to find a librarian and get them to develop the deep discipline knowledge that was required for that particular topic. I don't think that's the solution all the time, but I certainly think that there are some advantages when you're working with particular discipline, disciplines and faculties if you already have some content knowledge within that space. That doesn't mean you have to go back and do an undergraduate degree in science or engineering, but there are ways to become familiar with your, your discipline through connecting with the different professional groups, through researching and following some of the, the groups on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on social media feeds, and generally becoming familiar with the challenges within that discipline. I think there is a great advantage if you do have an undergraduate or some other form of background in particular disciplines. It's not necessarily essential but it may be something we see more and more of in the future as we become more and more expert within those particular faculty groups. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thanks Louise. Yeah, I think it's an important area that you know we can develop this discipline expertise and um, and then um, make it that much easier and, and better in the way that we engage with the researchers and yeah, they can get to know the library in a more personalised way, I think. Absolutely.
Sorry, can you hear me now? It would help if I pushed the talk button. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I tell everyone to hit the talk button and I forget to hit the talk button. Silly me. Okay. Um, anyone else have a question? Thank you for the thumbs up, Jenny. <laughs> No? Nobody else has a question? I can see Heather typing away, so I hope that's a question coming in. If you prefer to talk, Heather, I can unmute you. Just let me know and I can do that. Oh, sorry. A uh, question from Heather is general question as this is being recorded. Can we review it at a late? Definitely can. Um, Justine, I believe you'll be able to send this out later. I don't think I I'll, don't be, think I'll, I'll be, be listening to myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, great. Definitely we can review all these again. We have a lot of people typing, Louise, so hopefully. Excellent. Uh, Justine will be putting all these on the QLock YouTube page, so definitely we'll be sending that out. And Tegan's got yeah. a question about um, most of this is already known. How do you propose we get there? Good question, Tegan. It is a good it question. Is a good question. I think, part of, I think part of the challenge is we have to influence the the current program of study that most librarians are going through in their uh, library studies. I don't think the current structure of many of our courses prepare our librarians for the real world that we're in now. Uh, for those of us who are already in the industry, I think a lot of this comes back to self-accountability. I think this comes back to being responsible for understanding what we don't know and taking the time and effort to going out there and learning it. I think it comes back to getting our senior advocates on board. So we get there by ensuring that our VCs, that our academic provosts, that our PVCs understand our value and they understand it in their business terms. Uh, we get there, yep, and absolutely responsible for our own PD. But that's also where places like QLOC help because we can actually work together with this. It's about tapping into, if we have someone who's an excellent data management librarian, let's share that knowledge and seek out mentors and connect people so that we can expand that. If we have someone who has a particular discipline knowledge at one organisation, we can share it amongst the other ones. So it really is about continuing a practice that we've always had within libraries of supporting ourselves within the industry, but at the same time, understanding that we have to change. And sometimes that's the first and hardest step. Uh, thank you for that question, Tegan, and thank you, Louise. I also had a very similar question, Louise, and it's a follow-on from Tegan about when you talked about bite-sized chunks, um, getting all this um, new information out to students, and this is along the point of what type of skills, I mean, when we well, when I went through library school, um, we've learned a lot of traditional type of courses like metadata and um, sorry, cataloging. Do we need more stuff on like educational design? If I'm, if we are to put stuff online, do I need to know more about uh, multimedia design, um, web development, and stuff like that? <laughs> sorry, I'm just thinking the mental place. Yeah. Uh, the short answer is. Yes, yes, but maybe we don't all need to know that. So we can't all be experts in everything. That, that's an understanding. So there are going to be things in which we are, we have, a, we have a either a need, either a need to be able to do that because of our particular role or an aptitude. And that's where we need to look at leveraging some of those aptitudes. But yes, there are more skills that we need. And some of those I think are also about thinking more commercially. Uh, and I know that sounds like an odd thing, but if we have a service and we want that service to be taken up by our clients, how do we market that to them? How do we let them know who we are? How do we, we sell our value proposition to them? Uh, it, I think sometimes we we understand our own value in our industry. We, we know how important what we do is, but we forget to communicate that to somebody who doesn't necessarily have the same perception. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Louise. Um, Jackie's got a question. Do librarians' courses need to have specialties? And Tegan's mentioned, yes, uh, self-leadership would be good to learn. And I would 
agree with that one as well. Like you said before, like um, when it comes to when we're as practitioners, as working professionals, it's up to us to actually go and source all this information. And QLog is, I think, is a good place for that. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good question, Jackie. I'm not sure I have the answer, but I think it's a question that should be asked in other places as well from those people who are running the courses. So. Got some good questions coming through, and we are we've still got 15 minutes. Um, definitely a short. Sure. Does anyone else have any questions or any comments? Please feel free to put your hand up. I can turn on your mic or chat in the chat window. You can see people typing. I need some elevator music while people are typing. <laughs> Okay two, okay, two questions there. Um, biggest immediate challenge for academic libraries? I think the biggest immediate challenge for us is staying relevant in an environment that's changing so quickly. And by that I mean uh, we're looking at our, for instance, at Griffith University, like many other organisations, is looking at how do we compete in what may become a deregulated market? Uh, how do we continue to get the same amount of students in? In Queensland we have uh, an issue on the horizon where we're going to have a drop in the number of students who graduate from high school and are eligible for an OP to actually enter because of the way they changed the entry dates a number of years back within the primary school system. Uh, so we've got this challenge of increasing competition in the market for what was a fairly traditional client base. So when that happens and when budgets within universities get pushed, libraries are often one of the places where they look to say, do we really need that? Is it an essential service? Is it critical to what we're doing? I think our biggest immediate challenge is showing that we are critical and we are relevant and we are adding value. So, and I think that's now. I don't think that's in two or three years' time. I think that's, that's immediate. So, um, and the other question from Sarah, which specialties would cause us focus on if they did go down that path? Um, good question. I would think from my perspective, and this is just from my perspective, I'm sure there'd be lots of other people who have different ideas and who've been in academic libraries and other organisations much longer than me who also have some ideas. Uh, one of the first I would be thinking of would be contract management uh, because I think while we're focused at the front end, uh, there's a definite requirement to ensure that we're actually sourcing and maintaining a hold on the type of resources that we need to provide to our clients. Thank you, Graham. <laughs> I can see Graham signing off from QUT. Uh, the other specialties, look, I think we're looking at some of them we don't know yet. And part of that challenge is about how do we, like every other tertiary program and course, how does it adapt and stay relevant to an industry that's adapting all the time? Great, I can see Tegan typing, so um, I'll give Tegan a couple more minutes. If there's no more questions, I know Jackie has a question, so I shall unmute myself and get Jackie to speak. Um, Thank you, Tegan. Uh, so Louise, thanks for your presentation. You've got me really thinking about all kinds of things, so it was wonderful. But one of the comments that I often hear is that I'm too busy doing everything that I'm already doing, so trying to fit research support in amongst the more traditional roles is, is a big challenge for libraries. And um, it, I, I think it's a time issue as well as the new skills that are required and how do we fit that into the current schedule. Do you have any comments there? You're absolutely right, Jackie, and it's a challenge for almost all industries when we talk about it. I think even Stephen Tully talks about sharpening the saw and that sometimes in order to get things done well or to cut things fast, you have to stop 
learn the skills and go back to it and do it quicker. I think in this regard, though, one of the key aspects is the, the metrics. How do we record the impact of what we're doing? Because that then helps us decide, well, OK, what can we stop doing if we're going to start doing some of these other things? What isn't adding as much value? Uh, and if we have the metrics and we're recording the, the data on that, then it makes it easier for us to, one, make the decisions and then justify those decisions if we need to to the people that we need to talk to to make changes in the way we deliver services. So for me, it really is about what makes the biggest impact? How do we identify that? Let's put our focus there. And University of New England, yes, you're absolutely right. The need to act quickly enough to match the university's priorities because ultimately that's why we're here. We're here to achieve the university's goals and priorities, not our own, and we have to align with those. Okay, um, Sue Hickson here again now um, under Lynette's name, so I'm multi-personality today. Um, but I'd like to probably draw a close there. I think we've um, had all of the questions that we're going to get. I'd like to say a big thank you to Jackie for organising these sessions. Oh no, we might have another couple. They could just be thank yous. Um, and thank you very much um, for listening. The recording will be available. Um, ja um, Justine will send that out to everyone um, and we look forward to um, seeing uh, you all again next week at one o'clock for the next session. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Jackie, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, just thanks to Sue and, and Lynette for getting everything up and running and handing all the tech side of stuff. That's been wonderful and I could see Lynette was busy. Probably you'll need to listen to the recording, Lynette, because I think you probably missed a lot of the seminar. And thanks to Louise for taking on the opening seminar. It was really great, and you set the scene for the the upcoming seminars. So thanks to everyone. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks, guys. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Bye.